next, our final news roundup and information overload hour. All right, news roundup, information overload hour. Thanks for being with us. Toll free, our number is 800-941-SHAWN if you want to be a part of the uh, program. So over there on MSDNC, they're now floating the idea because most people don't believe that Joe Biden will be the Democratic nominee in 2024, but they think they found the solution. They think John Fetterman is the perfect replacement. Listen. Fetterman as a nominee at some point for president. Um, I know there's some variables, obviously. <laughs> but just a few. Just a few. <laughs> but I just, you know, it, it, what he did in the, in the super red, deep red parts of Pennsylvania and the way that he ran ahead of Biden, as you were saying, ran ahead of Trump. I mean, it just makes, it makes you wonder about his future. The only reason Fetterman won is because nobody asked him a question. He barely survived the one one hour debate, did very few appearances, let his surrogate speak for him, his social media staff speak for him. And unfortunately, you had at the top of the ticket a gubernatorial candidate the Republicans for put forward by the name of Doug Mastriano. Nice guy, uh, but he did not support any ex- exceptions at all on abortion, not for rape, incest of the mother's life. He lost by 13. Uh, Dr. Oz only lost by two points. Now, that means that 11 percent of of that vote did what's called split ticket. They voted for one party for governor and the other party for the Senate. That is that that those math numbers. It is a, a miraculous to have double digit ticket splitting. It doesn't happen. Not to that degree. Anyway, so nobody knows what they're really talking about here. But it was certainly a free pass uh, for sure. Um, and then you've got, you know, the allegations. Ron DeSantis couldn't have possibly won honestly and legitimately. People in Florida uh, absolutely love him. And and he's earned their support by doing a good job. It's that simple. That's why it's called the free state of Florida. But no, not at fake news, CNN and the hard hitting news show, The View. Ron DeSantis barely won in 2018 by 35,000 votes by the skin of his teeth against a black progressive little known mayor from Tallahassee, Florida. It didn't. T- yesterday he won by 20 percentage points. Why? Because he gained the system. Because he turned Florida into an unlevel playing field. They changed election laws, making it harder to vote by mail. They paraded uh, a bunch of people, black people, mm-hmm. that they arrested for uh, voting fraud and paraded them in front of national media. He created an election police. He also was very good in responding to to hurricanes and other tragedies. He also invested and laser-focused on Miami-Dade. And in the meantime, turnout turnout was 10 points lower than it was in 2018. In 2018, it was 63%. Yesterday in Florida, it was 53%. So that's not a red wave. Red wave is when people go out to the streets and vote. All right, I can't, you have, I what, can't handle it anymore. Just stop, because they, they make no sense. Um, Senator Marsha Blackburn of uh, Tennessee is with us, been on the campaign trail in a lot of states. Uh, she campaigned for General Bolduck in New Hampshire. Bolduck never really got on the radar until the last three, three and a half weeks of this campaign. It was never part of the Republican plan that they could win uh, that seat in New Hampshire. But, it, you know, polls started showing it was close, so we started covering it. Uh, she was out campaigning for Carrie Lake, who was just on with us, and Herschel Walker and Ted Budd and Adam Laxalt. Uh, and uh, Senator Blackburn uh, joins us now. How are you? I'm doing well, and watching these returns as they come in and being very cautiously optimistic and very hopeful that you're still going to see Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate. It it certainly is looking good, although if they keep finding more votes up out in Arizona, that mag- yesterday we had Carrie Lake on the program, and there were about 412,000 votes that they knew of outstanding and some votes, uh, you know, scattered here and there in some of the rural counties. And then they ca- they counted over 100,000 votes yesterday. So we should have been down to 300 plus something thousand. And now we're back up to 625,000 votes that are still outstanding <laughs> yeah. in the in the great state of Arizona. You know, Marco Rubio, I think, said it best when he said, how is it possible that we counted seven and a half million votes? Um, in five hours, and you can't count 625,000 votes for just in the course of today's 
business day. Why can't they do that? And it is astounding. That process question is one that is coming up by ten, from Tennessee. And every time I talk to somebody and people in the other states, they're going, look, Florida, Tennessee, Texas, a lot of other states, they open the polls, people vote, they close the polls, they count the early votes, they count the day of votes, they announce their election results. And before you go to bed, you know who won, who lost. You know if there is going to have to be a recount in any race, but you know the outcome. And it is astounding to me. Nevada and Arizona had such problems in 2020. You would have thought they would have gotten things cleaned up and that they would have been ready for an election. But now to all of a sudden be finding votes, uh, ballots that are coming in. It is really quite interesting, especially when you have races that are close, and especially when you have the Democrat nominee for governor is the current Secretary of State who is charged with overseeing these elections. You know, this is not complicated math that we're discussing here. Look, Senator, if I had my way, we would have institutionalized in every state. I think the states have to form their own system of voting as the Constitution requires. But with that said, I think you need voter ID. I think that has to be mandatory. Signature verification, chain of custody controls if you're going to do mail-in balloting, updated voter rolls. Uh, most states have laws where partisan observers get to watch the, the vote count start to finish. If I had my day, we'd make voting, we'd make election day a national holiday. Uh, we'd have partisan observers watch all of the voting, watch all of the counting, paper ballots, count them at the end of the day. Give out your number, who won, who lost. If it's close, check it twice, three times, four times. But it, it will have integrity in the system, confidence in the results, and we won't have to go through this ever again. And that would be the common sense thing to do. But for some of these states, they knew they needed to clean these things up, and they have not taken the steps to clean them up and guarantee their citizens. Think how this shortchanges their citizens. These taxpayers who are paying the bill for them to be there in these offices, and they cannot clean their system up so that people know votes are counted and that the system is accurate. Uh, there is a way. Lots of states have done it. They've made it easier to vote and harder to cheat. And that is the way we should be approaching election integrity. Well, I don't think it's that complicated. You know, we've been talking a lot right. on this program about migration. And by migration, it is people that are now, and I think it's been accelerated because of COVID, uh, people in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, people in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, that they've all kind of decided, all right, well, we're close to retirement. Uh, the weather's warmer. The taxes are lower. The lifestyle's better in places like where you live in Tennessee, in places like the Carolinas, and places like Texas, but especially Florida, which is taking in, on average, 850 new residents a day. I mean, it's a massive amount of people. You know how many people on any given day are moving into Tennessee or what the average is? I, I think that we are getting right about a 1,000 a week here in Middle Tennessee. But every one of our 95 counties are seeing growth. People are moving out of these high-tax state high tax high crime and they are choosing to move to tennessee we have no state income tax we have a low cost of doing business here we have a great quality of life and people are choosing to move here and the good thing that we are seeing time and again is that people are not bringing their politics with them we've got a lot of smart people moving to tennessee and they're going no we left california because of what was happening with the politics because of the high state income tax, the the crime, the lack of controls on illegal immigration, the drugs that were coming in. And, you know, you talk about that beautiful weather in California and people say it's just not worth it. And so they have chosen to come to Tennessee. And I enjoy so much getting to talk with them and to hear from them how important it is that we 
focus on preserving individual liberty, that we focus on preserving opportunity for all people, that we focus on protecting these individual rights. And the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the entire list, these are people that have lived through these governments that have taken away more of your hard-earned money, have taken more of your freedoms and your choices and options, and they are looking for a place that is going to let them exercise their freedom. And I, I think that Governor DeSantis said it well uh, the other night in his acceptance speech talking about why people chose Florida. Quick break, more with uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn, and then your call's coming up, 800 941 our number if you want to be a part of the program. All right, Marsha Blackburn continues with us as we uh, analyze Tuesday's results. You know, it, it is interesting, and it's a phenomenon in this way, that I wonder if it, in the end it may end up hurting future elections. In other words, it's always been hard for a Republican, and I'm talking about in the modern era, to win the presidency because you have to run the table you would always first have to win ohio and and florida uh now you have to think about georgia uh but more importantly is more and more people leave new york new jersey pennsylvania they tend to go to the east coast of florida and areas in the carolinas tennessee and texas but i'm just using florida as one example uh midwesterners they tend to go to the west coast of florida but they're losing population in states like new york and New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Michigan and uh, Indiana now and Illinois and in Wisconsin. And my fear is, is that the people that are going to be leaving are the ones that tend to lean conservative, making those states or rendering them perhaps even impossible for Republican presidential candidates in the future to win. And they need to. It's an electoral college we, system we have. But many times I will meet people who have moved to Tennessee from Michigan because they have family that is here with the GM plant that is in Spring Hill right outside of Nashville. And you know what they tell me, Sean, is that they wish they were able to move down here. They like the quality of life that we have. And I always say, well, you know, get your get to work. Uh, this year I would say go vote for Tudor Dixon. Go vote for John James. Vote for people that are going to reflect your priorities because you have a choice and you can. By the, by the way, your... John James did win his race. Yes, he did, which was mm -hmm. awesome. And uh, he deserved to win that race. And I am going to look forward to the impact he can have in a state like Michigan because leadership has an impact and leadership matters. And when you look at uh, what um, Governor DeSantis talked about the other night, uh, he talked about that exercise of leadership. And it is important to have leaders that tell you what they're going to do, talk to you while you're doing it, they're doing it, and then at the end, talk to you about the outcomes and the impact that that has. And that is something every state is going to benefit from. And one of the things I look at with the election is, you know, when people say, why didn't we have this wave? I say, look at what we did in some of these races, districts that were solidly blue where Republicans ran and they almost won. They almost won. The mm -hmm. Democrats had to separate themselves from the White House. They had to go out here and say, we need to go back to fracking, or we need to build a wall, or we have to deal with inflation, or we should be funding the police. All Republican positions. So now it is our responsibility to give these individuals the opportunity to keep their word to the people that have sent them to Congress, we need these pieces of legislation that will be to build the wall, to cut federal spending, to fully support the police, to deal with these drug dealers and the fentanyl. And we should have those pieces of legislation on the House and Senate floor and provide that opportunity for people to keep their word to people that voted for them and then during the 24 election cycle, we can remind people about who chose 
not to keep their word. We appreciate you being with us, uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee. As always, thanks for being with us. We appreciate all your hard work. 800-941-SEAN, our number. You want to be a part of the program. Quick break, right back. You're on the Sean Hannity Show, a place where free speech and the First Amendment are still alive and well. Get your dose of independence and liberty every weekday right here with Sean. All right, 25 now till the top of the hour, 800-941-SEAN. If you want to be a part of the program, to our busy phones we go. Uh, Don, in the great state of Iowa. Don, hi, how are you? Glad you called. Hi, Sean. Thank you for taking my call. I appreciate it. Thank you for calling. What's on your mind? Well, I'm a truck driver over the road right now. I'm uh, in Kansas, and I'm a Marine veteran. Today is Marine Corps birthday, so happy Semper, birthday, Marine. Semper Fidelis, my friend. Thank you for your service Thank to your country. You. Thank you, Sean. You as well. Um, I called because of this election. First off, uh, I'm amazed. Uh, Iowa voters appear to have gotten it right. Um, they... Uh, not only ousted a uh, Democrat congresswoman, they uh, uh, re-elected all the right uh, Republicans, and that speaks volumes for the Iowa voters. It definitely does. Uh, Iowa has always been a steady source of common sense. Uh, maybe a, maybe a, uh, once or twice that I can think of examples that maybe I didn't like the outcome. But um, look, I know, that, for example, Chuck Grassley's old, but Chuck Grassley's on his game. Chuck Grassley is as sharp as he's ever been. He gets crotchety at times, and I kind of like that about him, to be honest. Uh, he's out there doing a lot of work. He's got these whistleblowers from the FBI that we're going to now be able to hear from, hopefully, with the Senate, uh, hopefully switching to the Republicans, uh, go Herschel. And uh, I uh, I can tell you that, you know, these you've got good people, down-to-earth, heart and soul of America people in the great state of Iowa. Yes, thank you. I appreciate all that, and I'm sure Chuck Grassley does, too. I love the guy. He's great. Um, the reason I called, though, is to say I think this election uh, was was lost in 2020, uh, or actually uh, 2016, after all the campaign rhetoric of we're going to make Democrats pay, and we had all kinds of committees and everything else, but nobody paid for anything. And then look at the Democrats are doing. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody's under investigation. They go at it. They know how to fight. And apparently Republicans don't. I, I think Republicans, look, there, there's there are cases where they do fight, cases where they don't fight. I don't think they're going to have with their slim majority in the House. And, and if they get it, a slim majority in the Senate, um, they, they're going to have to work on an agenda. Ted Cruz was very clear about this last night. The American people, if you look at where did, where did Republicans win big, why did Senator Rubio and Ron DeSantis do so great in Florida? They did great in Florida because they served, they fought for the people of Florida. They worked hard for the people of Florida. Um, they didn't give in to the crowd. They led. They didn't, they didn't follow. And, and that, that result, resulted in amazing success at the ballot box for both of them. And I wish them both well. I'm so grateful to both of them for all the things that they did do. You know, I was in the middle of this. We put Ron DeSantis on often when he was under fire over his his contrarian view on the issue of COVID. And, and schools in Florida were open for in-person learning in August of 2020. Most schools all around the country were nowhere near that. Some schools two years later, you know, they still didn't even want in-person uh, learning for our, for the kids in spite of Florida's great success. So um, it just in is interesting. If you do the right thing and you fight for the people that you represent and you serve them that way and you follow through on your promises, that tends to be good politics. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there. I think if Republicans, if they want more seats in the House and the Senate, they can have it. We'll have a better cycle next time. It won't be every bellwether state. Democrats are on defense next election season, and I think that all of this is doable, and we can get the country turned around, and, and hopefully that's our goal. But for the for the Congress and the Senate now, their job is to go fight for those conservative principles and fight with all their might, and that means using the two big weapons that they have in the majority, which would be the power of the purse and the power of subpoena. You know, I'd like to know the answer to the origins of the COVID-19 virus. 
why, why was American taxpayer dollars going to a, a virology lab in Wuhan, China? Why were, why were they getting your money? Why, why were, what didn't they know about the gain-of-function research that was going on there? Everybody knew it. Everybody knew coronavirus research was being done there. You know, we lost well over a million Americans now as a result of this. And, and almost everybody's had COVID. It sucks. And all of it was preventable. And, and I would like to get to the bottom of Hunter's laptop. And I'd like to get to the bottom of whether or not our, our FBI upper echelon are politicized and using their positions of power in a corrupt fashion. I'd like to know if the Department of Justice is being weaponized. I'd like to know why Mayorkas is violating our law and aiding and abetting in human trafficking. So that's all things they can do, and they can get our financial house in order by insisting on fiscal responsibility, and, and they need to go back to that, too. I hope that answers your question, Don. Anyway, thank you. Richard in Kansas. Hey, Richard, how are you? Fine. First-time caller. It's an honor to visit with you, Sean. It's an honor I am a, I'm a solid Republican. I just vote Republican for local county, state, federal, whether it's good or bad, it's just a me thing. I'm just sold on the Republican Party. Yeah, I do have my frustrations. But I listened to an interview that you had with Dr. Oz, and he just seemed like a great guy, a uh, family man, had a great agenda. He was enthusiastic, just a wholesome individual. Then you guys started talking about his opponent, <laughs> and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How can Pennsylvanians, by approximately 210,000 vote difference, elect him as a senator? What's going in? What's in their minds that I don't understand that? Look, there. Are, I've I've analyzed this race more than any other one, and I think I've I've come up with the biggest issues that 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 Hopefully face Dr. Oz that we didn't anticipate. <laughs> Look, I mean, first of all, it came out of a brutal primary. Newt mentioned this earlier in the program. And, you know, $40, $50 million, you know, dumped on his head. I mean, I didn't recognize him by the time the primary was over. It took a number of months for the damage to kind of, the wound to kind of heal there. And there was a lot of resentment. And it took it took a period of time, which is fairly normal, especially in a contentious primary, for wounds to heal and everybody to unite around the candidate, which they did. And the biggest problem that I saw for Dr. Oz is that politically speaking, and I'm talking politically only, in Pennsylvania, it is not a popular position, especially post Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision, to be against abortion, even in the cases of rape, incest in the mother's life. Um, I do not hold those views or share them. Doug Mastriano didn't waver from those positions. He lost by 13 points. Now, when you have somebody at the top of the ticket losing by 13 points, that's a lot of ground to make up. You need, you know, people to switch their tickets. Oz successfully, he only lost by two points. He was able to successfully get double digit ticket switching going on in Pennsylvania. And that is a that is a huge success that rarely rarely happens so to me that was the single biggest factor and challenge that he was facing I'm, and again i'm not making excuses you you win some you lose some that's the way politics is i think he left it all in the field right. he ran a good campaign other things that he had to contend with there was a belief that he was not truly from pennsylvania which is not true um, but he did actually work for a living, unlike the trust fund brat who never worked a day in his life and wears a Halloween costume every day and tries to pretend he's a working guy, John Fetterman. And unfortunately, the math at that point became just too difficult for him. And I so, um, I, you know, I don't think I should have any regrets. I think he should hold his head high. I don't I, I don't think there was anything. That, I don't think there was any Republican, any Republican. And I'm looking at everybody that was in that primary, some of whom I like a lot, that could have overcome that deficit. I think it is an untenable position, politically speaking. Okay. Thank you. I just couldn't right. figure it out. Yeah. I mean, look, there are very strong feelings on abortion. And when, when Democrats hear no exceptions for rape, incest, the mother's life, 
they'll always go to the extreme and say, meaning a 10 year old girl is raped and she, she, you're not going to allow her to get an abortion. A woman's about to die. You're not going to let her get an abortion. Well, the converse of that, and I thought it would mitigate the issue more than it did based on exit polls is that Democrats almost unanimously support the idea of late term abortion, even up to the moment of birth, which is insanity. It's called infanticide to me. Uh, all right, let's get back to our phones. Uh, let's say hi to Steve in Arizona. Steve, I can't believe what Carrie Lake told us today. Yeah, it's a it's a rough one, Sean. But I went to the uh, county recorder's website and saw that my ballot has been counted. My uh, sister's has it. Um, I just wanted to reach out to you, Sean, and uh, remind everybody that we are in the middle of a fight still. I wanted to echo... Jim Jordan's comments yesterday that a win is a win. To use a uh, football analogy, we could have the best players. We could have the best strategy. We take the field and things not go according to plan. And any championship team knows that uh, you got to make game time adjustments. And like you shared just a little bit ago, you might need to win ugly. Uh, and uh, I think that um, if we end up with the House and the Senate, we've won ugly, but we have won. We're dealing with an unscrupulous media and a Democratic Party. And wh- whoever thought this was going to be a, a cakewalk, um, well, they can see that it hasn't been. Yeah, I'm, I, I tried to tamper down expectations and all of this wave tsunami talk. I, anyone that listens to this program regularly knows that I was saying just the opposite. I was telling people this was going to be notoriously close because, number one, I'm looking historically at the states that were in play um, on top of poll numbers, uh, on top of just gut instinct anecdotally now doing this since 1987, I never take elections for granted because I've seen this happen before over exuberance. It tends to lead to apathy. And I don't I, I don't want to create false hope in people or be Pollyannish about an election. And I felt I was being very realistic. And I kept reminding people, given the best examples that I could find in recent elections. And that was in 2016. Donald Trump wins three swing states. And he wins them by 70,000 votes. And that was the difference. That's how he defeats Hillary. In 2020, it's Wisconsin, it is Georgia, it is Arizona, and Joe Biden wins by 43,000 votes, and that was the difference in 2020, just 43,000 votes. So you look at a lot of these races, even in the House, I mean, there's so many of them that are are under a 1,000 vote difference. Every vote is mattering, and I want people to take that lesson and apply it now, especially as we're going to gear up for 2024, probably in a very short period of time. When we come back after our Christmas recess, we're going to be all over this. And and this, the presidential election season will begin. And I don't think Joe Biden is going to survive without a primary. My guess is in 2024 today is that Gavin Newsom will be the Democratic candidate, which is not a bad thing for Republicans. I think that uh, we need to call a couple game time adjustments. We are still in the fight. We need to focus on Nevada, Arizona, and help get Herschel Walker across the finish line. End of- right now, that's where my head is at. Let, let's get Nevada, Arizona straightened out. Let's get Herschel to win this runoff. If that can happen, you know what? It, it's going to be sort of like an aftershock, a massive aftershock that nearly is or a tidal wave post an earthquake. That would be... You know, if we won these races, that would be a massive win for the Republicans. Anyway, I appreciate the call, my friend. Thank you. This is how we run elections in Arizona. If people don't like that, they can go to the legislature, have the legislature pass new laws. But in Maricopa County, we don't follow the laws that are passed by the state legislature. How many votes from today are you still, are, do you still have to count? In other words, how many votes that were brought in uh, on the day of the election, in those envelopes, do you still have to count? We have to count all of those f- that were brought in from Election Day. None still. of those have been counted and reported, the 290,000. So that is for sure, 290,000. makes rep- up part of that 400,000, that's oh. right. When do you anticipate the votes will be counted in total, those 400,000-plus votes? 
we will be going into next week. There's some onesie twosies, uh, again, pursuant to Arizona law, but I think that we'll see the lion's share here wrap up by early next week. Okay. Early next week, can you give me a day? Are we early, talking Monday? Or we may, may, maybe, I, as long as you won't hold it to hold me to it. All right, that's going to wrap things up for tonight. We have big news out of Arizona and Nevada. All good news. Carrie Lake, uh, Newt Gingrich, Lindsey Graham, Laura Trump, Leo 2.0 Terrell, Reince Priebus, Stephen Miller. News you'll never get from the mob and good news tonight. We'll tell you all about it. 9 Eastern, Hannity, Fox News. See you tonight. Back here tomorrow. Thank you for making this show possible.